Um, I thought maybe for the final session, I'll we'll open it up more for questions, but I thought I would just maybe begin with the um, sort of the observation that I think throughout the papers, we've definitely seen the material turn um, or materiality turn. There has been a topographical turn, um, and we had a geographical turn here. And so, but these papers have all dealt with kind of the traditional, in some ways that to recall the traditional curatorial category of works on paper. You've all dealt with things that are on paper, which were portable, circulated, collected, recalled here for our scrutiny. Ellie, you had your um, sketchbook that was traversing the peninsula. You kind of talked about that geography in terms of center and periphery. Jeff, you had site specificity in a church. You also talked about the Via Ostienza, and you also had us visually under the ground in your topographical kind of consideration. Um, and Hyunji, you collapsed and bridge space, and you kind of talked about that in terms of the thematization and commercial, the thematization, thematizing commercialization, consumption as reverse prostitution. So I was just wondering to throw a question to all three of you whether there is any relevance in thinking about the medium of paper and its properties and qualities and the ways that you might have brought it into your discussion. And then this notion of bridging spaces or topographies, whatever. And then we can throw it out to the, um, I thought there were lots of very different things that you all dealt with. So this is my attempt to try to pull the papers together. And then we'll throw it out to the audience. And if you have nothing to say, we'll just throw it right out to the audience. No, I appreciate your okay. attempt. I think it's a good one. Um, of course, it's at the very center of everything dealing with um, Change Today, the sketchbook, but even you know his drawings in general, because they really have become incredibly dispersed and they are scattered all over, including, of course, I think even some pages from the sketchbook. Um, it was purchased by Morgan from Charles Fairfax Murray, and it was you know presented to him as here is a, a sketchbook, as if you know it had always been bound in this order, and this is a you know this is the finite object, and it's not. Um, more and more, I'm uncovering um, sheets and other collections that I believe were part of it, and even the you know the obvious fact as well that ten of the drawings. Um, at the Morgan are not by Chesede. They're in the Chesede de Sesto album, but they are by anonymous, they've been cataloged still as anonymous 16th century. So um, yes, trying to trace, I mean, the way that by its very um, portability, I do think it matters. Uh, what I'm trying to figure out as well with the conservators at the Morgan right now is, was this a sketchbook? Which, you know, maybe some people would think doesn't matter so much. I, I would argue uh, that it does. And so trying to even disentangle and figure out what were these pieces of paper and how were they moving and in what form? Were they bound together and when? And when then were they dispersed? Um, but to talk about portability is the, the very center of Chesede as the person and Chesede as the artist. And uh, of course, his paintings have moved, but as we all know, you know, paintings sometimes don't move around as much or you know, just not to the same degree as these little bits of paper do. So um, it's something I'm constantly running up against is it's very, um, the very nature of its ability to travel easily, quickly, and far. <laughs> are you, can I just follow that up? So are you imagining that there were over time multiple sketchbooks or? Um, it's one possibility. I okay. do think that, um, however, I'm leaning towards the fact that he, uh, Chase and I probably did have this sort of Roman sketchbook of, of his times mostly spent in Rome and then added to a little bit here and there. Um, it, it does seem like there, I'm trying to weigh the pros and cons, they literally have like columns mm -hmm. and lists of evidence for and against um, the sketchbook. Um, but they definitely, I know, were brought together at some point long ago. Um, and I think by, by Chase Day himself is, is what the evidence is leaning towards. But I don't think, for example, that there are enough other of his other surviving drawings that they could have formed another sketchbook. They're very different kinds of drawings, kind of more traditional um, you know, uh, preparatory studies for individual figures, very detailed workups of sometimes particular hands, feet, faces. Um, and they're just very different in technique, I think, and in purpose from what we see in the sketchbook studies. So I do think there was just one, at least that has survived. <laughs> Other comments yes. before we throw it out to the audience? Um, well, for me, you know, I was very interested in this painting um, 
and also the idea of a lost painting that I still gathered um, would have been really important for the time for the reasons I laid out and kind of what that means for, I don't know, the historiography of the artist or the Baroque when you have this important monument that becomes lost and then forgotten and you can't really um, recreate it except we, we are fortunate to have such rich surviving drawings so it was sort of turned to works on paper for that and then um, even though I had seen reproductions of the drawings, it wasn't until I went to study them in person that I started noticing those background details, and I got very excited. And I mean, all those photos are just from my iPhone zooming in and realizing, um, you know, it's one thing if you were to see that in a painting from, you know, you'd have you'd be standing far away and you would maybe see it in the background, but it's so in, works on paper. You know, you're getting this intimate glance into Tigoli's working process against multiple sheets and that kind of fixation on always including at least a few of the same monuments, especially the pyramid that I love seeing from the really quick sketches to the final squared version shows you that was kind of the fixed idea that he had in um, placing this scene. So, And you've got sort of a reproductive etching that is in certain ways promiscuous in its sort of journeying around as well and going to mm -hmm different environments. So. Yes, absolutely. And paper as a support is very important for Song because he um, he's primarily an etcher and watercolorist. I haven't been able to locate any um, oil painting done by him. He dabbles on lithography just a little, but it's mostly his works are on paper. Um, and he he does a lot of etching, so he almost treats this copper plate as some sort of his sketchbook. Okay. Um, so he just dabbles and um, creates this really whimsical vignette and then prints, and nobody knows why he did that. <laughs> um, with this particular etching and some of um, similar designs that Somme does for other commercial establishment in Paris, what really interests me is that he does these um, commercial designs for calling cards and etching, which is not the medium that is most fl friendly to mass produce. Um, so I'm, um, there's a wonderful article by um, Elizabeth Menon, who is one of the very, very few scholars who has done any work on Henri Somme, um, and she delves into this kind of um, mismatch between Somme's, Somme's, work, Somme's work's commercial nature and this nature of um, etching. Okay. Yeah. So questions? Um, do we need the little? Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> uh, we will bring. So maybe we'll start with Stephen, and then we'll move across the front row. Um, this question is not about paper, but it's for Jeffrey. And I was really interested in the dimension of um, the altarpiece itself, which, you know, inferring from the drawings, uh, locates the beholder in the space with a sort of like ph phenomenological awareness of the spot where they are standing and looking at the image. Um, I'm just wondering if you, if, if we can think about this in a broader context for this. I mean, it's a, it's a, I, I can think of the Raphael does this in the Salad of Constantino, which reminds you of the spot where you're standing. The Constantine's vision of, um, of the cross uh, at, the, at the Battle of the Mulvian Bridge is happening right in the Vatican uh, at this spot as it was um, a, a millennium before. And I can think of Barocci, especially as uh, approached by Peter Gilgren in a recent book, um, incredibly kind of sight aware. Um, making you think of, for instance, the martyrdom of San Vitale, of the actual pozzo, in, uh, you know, which is preserved as a, a topographical um, place of pilgrimage um, in, in, in Ravenna. Um, the other person I, th you know, I think who does this is, is Lotto. But um, who in Rome is doing this at this point? Is there anybody? I'm just asking out of curiosity if you've been thinking about why did Chigoli decide to do this at this point? Um, well, I mean, that's sort of... It's a, I'm, I like the examples you gave to think about outside of Rome because that could help me contextualize this within a larger study. And um, since I just wrote the introduction to my dissertation, I had to kind of give the context leading up to what, this moment. And my sort of markers, they begin in, um, with, they don't have this um, specificity yet with this site, but the kind of precedents I cite begin with the martyrdom scenes in Santo Stefano, for example. I mean, those aren't about the actual site of Santo Stefano, but bringing up martyrdom imagery. And then I get to um, you know, tracing a few things like, um, but for me, the moment in 1600 with Santo Cecilia by Moderno, the marble sculpture that 
recreates her appearance when her body was miraculously fa uh, found in that year, 1599, and then um, her, her actual corpse is displayed at the church for 33 days, and then for various reasons, the patron commissions the sculptor to make this marble version of that that is now displayed under the high altar. And that, to me, is this sort of moment combined with the Caravaggio entombment to think about bodies and altars in new ways at the beginning of the 17th century. And then Chigoli, chronologically, is the first. But what's interesting, since you mentioned a well, is my, um, the next case study is almost, you know, let's say a year later, Chigoli gets another commission that he gives to his student, Billy Verrick, which is the martyrdom of St. Calixtus, a third century pope who was thrown into a well. And it's for the Church of San Calixto in Trastevere. And then the, the, the altar, which is the altar piece is still there. And to the right of the altar is the well, so it opens up into the ground. And um, that's another very complicated thing I've looked into because there's the well that goes into the earth, the actual hole, but the, the marble relic of the well has an interesting history. And it was sold in 1809, uh, and it's now in Germany. But I try to recontextualize all these things. And then I have an image of another case study of St. Sebastian being thrown into the sewers, so that's 1612. So um, that's sort of my overview. Thank you. Um, thank you, all three of you, <laughs> for three great, three more great papers. My question is for Hyung Ji, um, and I'm wondering if if we could get the slide um, of um, the one that you showed the most, the the fantasies uh, japonaise. If not, that's fine. Um, oh, thank you. I don't want to make a big they're deal out of this. It's only if it's easy. Um, okay. I can talk about it. It's okay. They're going into the booth. Pardon? They're, they're going into the booth to do I it. I can just sit down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved your paper, and um, I thought it was fascinating and like really convincing. What you were saying about the um, the imagery, kind of, um, you know, articulating this fear of women and fear of, of a female um, consumer desire and sexual desire and the way that these are kind of intersecting. Um, something that I was, that struck me um, that as I was looking at that, um, that one etching um, was a, what had to do with the objects that are stretching into the background and how endlessly they go into the background and how um, kind of mundane the objects actually look. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of articulation of each one. Um, and I, it, I was wondering if, you know, if, if, if Soam is poking fun at, um, yeah, I'm looking at the sort of ones on the left, on, on the right, in the right foreground, and there's just this sort of like endless parade of, of objects coming in, and I'm, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, and I, I started thinking about whether or not he's poking fun at, you know, not just this I idea that the, the woman is, has this fantasy of what Japan is, but that she has a, a fantasy that these objects actually have value, mm -hmm. and that, that, um, and, and that maybe it's, it has something to do also with, um, you know, commodity culture and, and, I mean, obviously it does because you were alluding to that, but the kind of arbitrariness of value. Uh, I see. Um, yes, absolutely. The, like the simple rendition of porcelain objects and um, these holding plants, absolutely. Um, in, the late 1870s, anything that came from Japan was extremely popular, especially after um, the 1867 um, Paris Exposition Universal and 1878 Paris Universal Exposition, where um, there was a Japanese exhibition, and everybody in Europe was so excited to see these um, seemingly mundane objects, almost um, like folk art, directly imported from Japan to Europe. And everybody was really kind of longing to own some. And the popularity got to the point where these objects started to appear in Parisian department stores. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of value, I think you're right. I don't think they had um, 
an absolutely kind of fine artistic value because they were kind of in as a dump kind of imported from Japan to Europe to really meet the demand of um, European consumers. I guess what I'm asking is, is, is he also saying something about the way that capitalism works? Hmm. I think maybe. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I think he's definitely making a comment of how capitalist uh, capitalism works in these commercial establishments. He is definitely recognizing that women is becoming more and more visible as consumers. Um, I'm not sure as to whether he is making any kind of value judgment on that. Mm -hmm. well, I thought that the quote that you opened with was so fascinating because it seemed to be charting this move from almost now it's turning into kitsch. That guy was basically saying this used to be something that only, you know, the avant, I guess avant-garde and kitsch, but like this used to be something that only the really sophisticated people in the know, mm -hmm. you know, collected and it was cool then. And now that any, you know, house-born housewife can go out and buy it, it's become kitsch and it's not special anymore. And that's as part of you know, a lot of theories of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when Goncourt was writing this in his journal, mm -hmm. he had um, a very specific agenda yeah. to kind of promote himself as a pioneering Japanese mm -hmm. who brought in this new culture to a Parisian society as this um, avant-garde figure. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure as to how he was so faithful to this dramatic comment mm -hmm. that he was making about popular Japanese. Yeah. He was a very dramatic figure. Um, He's kind of posturing. Yes, <laughs> yes, so yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered yeah, your thank question. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I have a comment. First, I was so happy to see, Ellie, you show the uh, Cesare da Sesto Louvre drawing that sort of after uh, Raphael's figure in the Transfiguration, because for me, it was a wonderful example of an artist's practice where by I don't you know, he, he's not copying, obviously, the, the figure in the Raphael, but he's saying, oh, that's a canonical pose, that I am going to take a model in the studio, tell the model to pose in the way of the transfiguration figure, and then do it again from, from life. And, and that's something that in the um, Karachi practice was done again and again, as has been established. And so here we've got Cesare mm -hmm. doing this. And so I, I was well, fascinated. We Excuse me? We might, because yeah. the thing that's interesting about this is it might once again be about exchange of drawings and not really about anything from life because while nothing by Raphael survives, it is this woman in the nude, although we could imagine perhaps he has. Um, yes, he, yes. He drew yes, from, yes. from the nude, I don't know. But um, there is a drawing by, that's been variously attributed to Raphael's school or to perhaps Giulio Romano that's in uh, the Albertina in Vienna that is actually a nude version, version of, of this. a turning woman. So it's a, it's, so but this is the way, yeah. Chase kind of inserting himself yeah. into this very amorphous, open you know, workshop of Raphael in Rome yeah. at that time. Um, or it could be him drawing from life. I don't know, but there is that possibility of, of that. that but drawing. then, of course, this this figure then becomes a figure for Anibale Karachi mm -hmm. in uh, the the choice of Hercules. So, so right. it's like a it's a it's mm -hmm. this pose that becomes canonical over time, and and Raphael is the, is this figure then that gets in a sense deified, and so in in Jeff's talk there were references to Raphael as well. So Chigali starts off in the compositional drawing with a s compositional sketch after the entombment, but that's just sort of to get his ideas flowing and then he goes somewhere else with it. Mm -hmm. And then in the Vignali drawing, here I have a question sort of for both of you, where if it's indeed by Vignali after the, um, just the figure of Paul. So Vignali comes to Rome and what does he do? He goes out to San Paolo, and of course, Chigoli for him would be an older a master of great accomplishment that he's going to look at. The, but he doesn't do the compositional drawing of the altarpiece, perhaps he does, but he focuses in on this. And so it makes me wonder whether this is also an act of thinking about 
the importance of San Paolo as a pilgrimage site and the importance of the burial underneath the altar. So it's not just about copying from mm -hmm. a revered older Florentine master, but it's about something else too. The, the traveling to this site, the experience of the um, altarpiece, and I wonder if Fouches that are going, you know, and traveling, if he's not also responding to things other than just seeing things and copying them down in his sort of travel uh, sketchbook. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's a question in there, but it's a okay. part of you know that you're you're provoking these you know ideas for further conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with that. I would have to think about there's is the figure study on the verse, so so he does both figures. My next step, I would be interested in. Um, I've heard in Rome at the uh, that they have you know boxes of Vignali drawings. Then maybe there's sort of I could do some motif hunting for things that might also be after Chigoli or even specifically from the altarpiece. Maybe there's something else I could find. And I guess I would just say quickly too, is I, I really like the example and of course that it is Karachi that you're bringing up as well because so much of you know what we talk about with the Karachi is canon formation or anti-canon formation and how already you know something that Chase today is drawing then perhaps as Raphael himself, because there's some interesting things about thinking about dating, and then when would that mean Cesare was passing back through Rome? Um, you know, this is when that soon-to-be canonical work is still in the process of even being worked out, and Cesare is present there at that moment, the sort of moment right before we get some, so much of this canon formation. And so the way that Amibile uses it already, uh, you know, I guess one generation later is so different. And perhaps what you know, Chesley's encounter with this is, is so, I guess, like more direct or not one remove. And it's just at a different, obviously, point in time, but also just an entirely different approach to, to his sources. Yeah. You're going to just toss that back to Rose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, well done. I feel that, that feels more successful than finishing a talk, <laughs> catching it. <laughs> Uh, thank you all um, so much for, for your talks. Um, as, as someone interested in paper topography and paper as topography, I was obviously really, um, your talks made me think in so many interesting ways. Um, this is my attempt to kind of ask a question of, of all of you and trace a thread through all of your talks. And I wanted to focus on, I'm trying to find the right word, um, either distance or absence or both. Um, and I guess what I mean by that in, in all of your talks is, um, Hanji, your talk, um, I was so struck by this notion of Japan as an absent thing, both distant but also like not even existing. Um, and also thinking about maybe commodity culture in that way, right? The commodification entails a kind of absenting and of course in a critical way, um, alienation. Um, when something becomes a commodity, there's a kind of distance or absence that becomes necessary. Um, Ellie, as much as your talk um, so skillfully talks, um, you know, really brings in a, a, an idea of transit and transmission across mediums and also across geography, it strikes me that um, in Cesare's kind of um, peregrinations and his self-fashioning as this artist, um, keeping his sources at a remove seems crucial to how he then uh, introduces them into a new location. Um, and then lastly, Jeffrey, um, I love this notion of site specificity, specifically in, in you know, being distant from Rome or being outside of Rome. And of course, you're also dealing with the absence of the the thing itself at the center of your project. And I guess for all of you, I wanted to, to know whether um, working in this way has helped you, I don't know, think about loss or absence or distance um, as historically constituted um, ideas, like whether your research has, has allowed you to see those things as historical subjects in their own right, um, and whether there's been any interesting insights as a result. That was a series of very good questions. Long. <laughs> Yes, okay, so <laughs> the two big things, of course, that I'm always, I don't know, variously trying to dance around or confront with Cezanne is um, copying influence. And both of those, of course, however you want to define them, they have a lot of, you know, valence to them, but um, are kind of dealing with absence, presence, or proximity, or distance. Um, 
And of course, that they just can become these really big catch-alls. And I find myself using it as a shorthand all the time, too. We all know what it means to say, oh, he copied this here to this, or he was influenced by this here. Um, and there's obviously, it's, I, I don't know, one of the ways I try to combat it is by, um, I try to um, deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, because it does vary so much, his relationship to his to the other ideas or inspiration or motifs, whatever you want to call them at times. Um, I think he's really um, strategic about it often, and it um, can sometimes also raise that, that uh, persnickety question of well, who would get the references, um, and is that part of, I don't want to say game because that makes it seem trivial, but is that part of it as well? How much, you know, since he's never really that overtly copying things, um, who's going to pick up on it all the time. Of course, not everyone is going to get it, so then it becomes also this, um, a lot of the burden kind of becomes on the, um, on the viewer to see how much they're, you know, how much of this they're going to get, and do they even, you know, if you don't know something's there to begin with, then is that absence <laughs> uh, magnified? Um, so I, um, I guess it's not really an answer, but just say that yes, <laughs> I, I pick up on these same things that obviously you've noted as well, and they're really important to, to be keeping in mind, and I'm always trying to deal with them. I mean, for me, I talked about the, you know, the loss of the painting in terms of uh, maybe not recognizing its importance uh, for, I don't know, art history, but there's also a, another thing I didn't talk about, which is that he died um, before finishing it, but it was left um, installed. And we really have no, it's impossible to know how far he got or what it looked like. But it was enough that it was okay to leave it on the altar, that everyone knew what the composition was and that you could make a print after the composition. So it was that legible um, enough. And also there's an, in, there's an interesting in the 17th and 18th century guidebooks and in some of the artists' biographies, like Gaudinucci and others, talking about that it's, you know, it remained on the altar unfinished, but some, you know, it was imper it was perfect in its imperfections, which is something Vasari says about Michelangelo and um, his unfinished marbles, for example. And you know, they they say the monks um, at the church left it and didn't let any hand touch it because it was so, you know, perfect. It was perfect even though it was unfinished, but. Um, I mean, that unfinishedness is another very, very interesting type of, of loss that, um, you know, he died. And he mentions on his deathbed that they still owed him money for it, but, I mean, otherwise they had, <laughs> seemed to have a good relationship, um, but we don't really know. And then by 1823, which is around its last, I think 1815 is the last time it's mentioned, um, it, was it was definitely damaged by humidity, especially on the outskirts of Rome and possibly the material being on slate. So then there would have been like a third loss or however you want to count. So there's the unfinishedness at his death and then the whatever loss happens. Hmm. And then the, the ultimate loss, unless, unless it is somewhere hidden. And I know this is a kind of heyday for works on slate, but does it matter in the context of entombment that this is on stone or? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, Yeah, I, have to, yeah, I have to think about it, but yeah, it is a, yeah. you know, beginning with Sebastiano a hundred yeah. years earlier, and then Rubens right. at the same year is painting on slate at the Chiesa Nuova, yeah. and it's an interesting time for that. Um, other questions from people in the audience? There's, Rachel, you'll have to throw about two rows again. Yep, two rows. Uh, my question is towards the Japanese fantasy. I was just very curious about the part where you talked about the imagination, like how they wrote books on how they like hallucinated. And I was just a little confused because it's so abstract. How did they know these women were daydreaming and imagining and attributed this to hallucination and wrote? Like I was a li I'm a little perplexed about that. Um, so. The truth value of those statesmen are very um, difficult to determine. Um, and we can't really be sure whether they, these medical authorities were actually diagnosing these symptoms or prescribing their um, 
ideas of what these daydreaming and fancies were based on their understanding of how um, hysteric women were. Um, but in terms of um, just using this mental faculty to imagine um, something outside one's immediate kind of realm of experiences and um, kind of thoughts constrained or shaped by norms, um, I'm, very, I'm more interested in how these um, kind of imaginative experiences could assume subversive um, qualities because it kind of implies that, implies a possibility of kind of going beyond these norms and conventions that these medical authorities were very much keen to um, protect under the name of protecting the bourgeois order, the gender roles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure if this answer um, consolidates any of your confusion. I have a question, like how did they think, of, how were they like, it's weird, these women are imagining. Like, how did they come to that point where they were pre prescribing, oh, where they were prescribing these women? Like, I'm, I'm a little confused about the, the start. Like, what was the origination of this prescription? Like, what was the triggering? In terms of um, diagnosing what constituted women's daydreaming? Yeah. Um, I would have to go back to those sources because it's been a while since I um, consulted the three sources that I showed um, by Sigmund Freud, Josef Breuer, um, Kirchhoff. So I would have to go back to that. I think it may be the moment to sort of close the proceedings and to thank this particular panel and then all the speakers. And <laughs>